All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to have as my guest, the author you've heard me talking about understandable economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know. And I'm going to address that in just a couple of minutes. And I have to tell you, Howard Yaris, a professor, attorney, economist, I'm not sure. Do I say attorney? Howard Yaris, do I say sure. professor? Sure, that's, that's accurate. That's uh, each of those is accurate. But tell me a little bit about your education. That's a, a lot of a lot of education. Well, I I, I, actually, <laughs> I my education. I'll start with the first the first twelve years. I went to uh, public schools in Brooklyn. After I left, my high school was shut down as a failing high school. Uh, I thought it was failing while I was there, but I guess the the educational administrators caught up with with what I had already realized. And then I went on to Brown and majored in economics. And I also studied at the London School of Economics and I wound up becoming a lawyer. I went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So I've seen both sides of the uh, educational spectrum from a failing public high school in Brooklyn to Brown University, which I thought was a great place to go to college. Well, and the the failing, if you don't mind, the, the failing school they closed it down. They weren't yeah. able to. It's gone. Wow, that's that's interesting because that was how many years ago? A lot. <laughs> and that, well, I think about today, where with, with uh, how difficult it is with some public schools. I don't want to get into specifics, but when I learn that there are kids in the fourth grade that are reading at the kindergarten level, and they are the, how do I want to say it? The school encourages the teachers to pass them. They're never going to get caught up in reading. I'm so, so, I, That's a topic for my- I, Social promotion. Yeah. But you obviously did well. And I love that. Economist, professor, attorney, businessman, and activist. I So your book- Understandable economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know. I've got to tell you, I thought, forgive me, I thought, okay, I'm interested. I'm not going to understand it. I'm, I'm, I don't understand economics. I was shocked at how directly you put things out and how you explain it in a language that I can understand. I'm not having to look up, having to look up every word. And you, this is seriously a an incredible book, because and you understand the importance of so many things. I have so many questions for it. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> if you can see this. I don't know if you can see how many pages I've got turned. Oh in. my! That's yeah, really, so that's really something. And don't, yeah, so I know we're not going to be able to to get to them all. Tell me if you would first the when you, why you decided to write the book. Very simply, I grew up in a family and a neighborhood where there were great economic difficulties. And I became aware of the great disparity in society. And I was very interested in it. And I thought there were a lot of inequities. And I, I also believe that if you want to improve a system, which I wanted to do, you have to first understand it. So that led me to study economics. What what led me to write the book was simply how extreme these problems were becoming. I use the term in the book, the winner take all economy. And I think it's, it's, a, it's something that's really become much more of a problem even from when I was a kid. And my hope is that more people will understand what's going on in the economy and therefore they would support uh, better policies that would be aimed at, at making real improvements. Not the Tea Party, not Donald Trump, not Occupy Wall Street, but policies that could actually result in improvements in the lives of ordinary Americans. And that's and that's what should happen. I've got to uh, ask you, if you don't mind, for David, who makes the ordinary seem extraordinary and the truly extraordinary seem possible. It's a beautiful dedication. Thank you. I, am I allowed to ask who David is? Oh, it's my spouse. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's a beautiful. I have to tell you, that is a beautiful dedication. Sometimes I know it might sound weird. I'm asking you about the dedication. 
Sometimes it gives me insight, a little insight into mm -hmm. who wrote the book. Sometimes not. I understand. Sometimes they're, you know, they have initials, whatever. But thank you for explaining that. I knew I had to write a dedication. I sat down and I think I came up with it in about 30 seconds. <laughs> wow. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks. The preface, I love this, uh, the Albert Einstein quote. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. That's one of the Einstein quotes I had never heard. I I, I absolutely love that. It's very interesting. And I teach at NYU, and I, I shouldn't single out of NYU because I taught at a, a variety of, of colleges. And students sometimes use acronyms or, or very technical words. And I just shoot back, what do you mean by that? What exactly does that mean? And I catch them totally off guard. They can't answer that, uh -oh. which means that they really don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I think these fancy words are, are either a sign that people don't fully understand what they're talking about, or it's maybe an attempt to hide the ball from you, like synthetic credit default swaps. That's a term investment bankers use. All it is is a bet on whether a company is going to be solvent or not. That's it. That's all it is. And you have to break it down. Credit, default, default, credit. It all it, It's just a big, fancy, scary term for we're making a bet on whether some specific company is going to survive or not. And I try to explain that in the book and demystify some of those really um, obscure terms. Obscure terms. And you do a beautiful job of it. Again, you make it really... Under, you do make it understandable. And again, that wasn't, it was just, a, I was, I dare say a bit skeptical if I would get it, if I would get it. And if I get it, everybody can get it. Believe me. You, you, and the thank you. And also, really the, thank you. That. And the importance of it. And absolutely the importance of it. I mean, when you talk about even defining capitalism and some of the different ways in socialism and just, it's really, really important. So I think what pushed me over the edge, I'm sorry to cut in with that oh, please. topic was when everyone started calling Donald Trump a conservative. Here is someone who broke every convention, did everything differently from the people who preceded him. And that's conservative. That's the opposite of conservative. That's right. And I think that was that was one of the things that pushed me over the edge and, and to some extent motivated me to write this book. And that's uh, that's yeah. Again, the 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 titles, the names, you know, putting people in a a box, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and using and people not understanding what the terms mean. I know when when I've talked with people about uh, Hitler, the National Socialist, being you know they well he wasn't a socialist. You know, it just you have to understand and and dig in and read and learn as I did with your wonderful book. Understandable mm -hmm. economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know. The author, my guest, Howard. Let's talk a, a little bit about, and I'm. you don't mind if I jump around. Not at all. One of the things, by the way, one of the things I've turned down, a number of hours American workers worked per week dropped from 58.5 hours in 1900 to 34 hours in 2020, uh, where do you think that's going? I think it's going to continue to drop as, as productivity increases, as we figure out how to automate more things. I think it'll continue to drop. But what I find interesting about that is that people in Europe, a lot of the European countries actually work fewer hours than Americans and so their G GDP is, is somewhat lower. And sometimes people look at those GDP numbers and say, oh, Germans are not doing as well as Americans or the French are not doing as well as Americans. Well, is it, are they really worse off because they work fewer hours per week and fewer, fewer days per year leading to somewhat less, less output? Again, it's one of the main themes of the book is economics is too important to be left to the e economists. Economics involves choosing how we spend our time, how we spend our resources, and it involves value judgment and judgments. And to the extent you outsource them to econ economists, you're outsourcing your value judgments to these people. They may have the same values as you, they may not. The point is we should all be thinking about these things and decide, for, that's a great example. Do we want to live in a society where there's slightly less wealth, but more leisure time? That's a value judgment or a choice. 
it, it's, there's no right answer that comes out of some equation that tells you that. Uh, yeah, there's no, no right answer. I, I, I think that. Uh, your chapter two, why are some people losing faith in our economic system? And you also talk, you talk about in that chapter, does the, our political process fairly represent the wishes of most Americans? And you read the answer, money has a loud voice in our politics and culture, current trends are amplifying it even more. And then, of course, you talk about in Chapter 8 about the lobbying issue, and I will get to that. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, if you would, about that statement regarding does our political process fairly present? Well, 100 years ago, that you could you could take out an ad in a newspaper that had a certain amount of circulation in your community. Now you could blast your your message across the world. The the media is being dominated by fewer and fewer massive media companies. Uh, if you look at local newspapers, there are so many fewer local newspapers than there used to be. So there's there are people again the winner take all phenomenon that I talk about in the book appears throughout the economy and throughout society. And when it comes to having a platform or the ability to promote your point of view, more and more, fewer people are having more sway, more power in that regard. And that's leading to, to a certain amount of domination by a, a smaller and smaller group of people. Wow. I, I want to tell you, when you said that about newspapers, my studio uh, was in the newsroom of a newspaper that published for 150 years that shuttered in 2019. And again, all those years, all that, all what is lost with the newspapers around the country. And I get concerned that too many people are getting all their information on social media. Well, you're doing your yeah. part by, by being Thank a great you. independent voice. Thank you. So, I appreciate but that. But it's becoming, as I'm sure you, you can, you know better than I, that it's becoming more and more difficult as large dominant media companies dominate the market. And I noticed when it came to publishing the book, all the publishers were looking for someone with a quote unquote platform. The quality of the book wow. was secondary. They're looking That's for awful. people sorry, who I'm had sorry. already been victors in that, that winner take all game. And I, again, I talk in, in Understandable Economics about how this is basically this phenomenon you could see in, in every field. I talk about singers. Before, before we had record, recordings, every city, every town had people who were involved in the theater. And now you, know, you yeah. click on the TV and you see the, something that's, that appears everywhere in the world. There are a few big producers of entertainment and the local producers are all gone. Yeah. And it's, and I, I wonder where it's going from here, but that's something maybe we can discuss at another time. Uh, again, jumping around in this, in this wonderful book, Understandable Economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think. I've got to concur. It is much easier than, than <laughs> I thought and more important than you know. And you talk a lot about some of the things. Let's talk about where does money come from? I, I love that because one of the things I've always, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm asking you a question and I'm commenting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, attorney professor. <laughs> well, it's so interesting because where money came from for thousands of years was the same place. Precious metals and some other scarce commodities. That's That was money for almost all of human history. And then- Several hundred years ago, we experimented with pieces of paper that represented those precious metals. So basically, our money was precious metals or some, some proxy for precious metals for virtually all of human history. In the 20th century, this is incredibly recent, recently, we severed that link. The paper money we have is just the paper money. There's nothing backing it anymore. In a way, in an ironic way, it's very similar to a cryptocurrency, to Bitcoin. It's just something created out of thin air. And this is, you could still view this as somewhat of an experiment. When you, when you wrote about, and I, I've got it marked somewhere in the book, 
that about what it costs to produce a bill. A, mm -hmm. You know, six cents, I think, for and then there's a few cents, a, right? A couple more for yeah, for a a larger bill. Mm -hmm. When you say that again, I remember reading about and under, knowing about the going off the gold standard. That had some backing that we we knew. Now, like you say, it's whatever we, whatever somebody says it is. Well, we can buy, that's what, somebody buy, is this, this piece of paper for something else. Right, is is pretty much the Federal Reserve, and these are people yeah. who decide how much money we have. The more the more money we have, the more money they inject in the economy. The less value it has, the less money they inject. Again, it's supply and demand. The less money they inject, the more dear it is, the more valuable it is. So they have a lot of sway over the value of our money. So let's talk about the Federal Reserve. And you explained it. I think that's some some area that most people don't have a clue. They know the words, they know the name, they know the they know it exists, but don't really understand it as I've got to say, either did I until I read your book. I'll say something Sorry. about the Federal Reserve I've been thinking about recently. Could you imagine the outcry, the incredible publicity the U.S. Supreme Court would get if they made a decision that threw several hundred thousand people out of jobs? You would not hear the end of it. But that's what the Federal Reserve is doing right now by raising interest rates, by making money more dear, more scarce. They're causing people to cut back on spending. They're causing businesses to... Re, re, uh, retrench a bit, thereby causing people to lose jobs or people not to get jobs. It's so interesting to me that people follow the U.S. Supreme Court so carefully, but decisions that affect literally millions of jobs, people's opportunities in life are sort of off the radar screen. And I think there is a similarity between the Fed and the Supreme Court. They're both run by a small group of people who are appointed by the president. They both have a very long tenure. So there's a, and they both greatly affect our lives. It's just interesting to me that the US Supreme Court, and again, I'm speaking as a lawyer now, gets so much attention, but what the Fed does is sort of under the radar. I think people are intimidated by it, which again, getting back to the purpose of the book is trying to reduce that intimidation factor to some extent. Wow. Again, I love this book. Professor Attorney Howard Pierre's book, Understandable Economics. And I, again, I keep saying this, I've learned so much in the book. I want to ask you, we, we talk about inflation and inflation is in the news and you write about it in your book. Talk about inflation, describe inflation, because people say it and they understand the cost of goods. Tell us about it. Well, there are inflation. two things I'd say. I should say three things. What is inflation? That's the simplest thing. It's an increase in average prices. Yeah, apartments on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and in Malibu in California have soared in value. That's not inflation. Inflation <clears throat> is an increase in average prices. So that's my first point. I think most people actually do know that. Second point, what causes inflation? Yeah. This people may not know. There's a certain amount of money on the one hand out there, and there's a certain amount of stuff that our economy produces. Cars, television shows, all kinds of things people buy. If the amount of money increases compared to the amount of stuff, you're going to get an increase in prices. If the amount of money decreases compared to the amount of stuff, you're going to get a decline in prices. And if they both sort of stay sta stable, if they both increase, and this is the Nirvana scenario, at roughly two, 3% a year, you get stable prices. That's a great situation. The amount of stuff that is available for purchase increases by two, 3% a year, and the amount of money increases by two, 3% a year. That provides opportunity to people, provides stable prices. The point is we've gotten this out of balance. What's happened in the past couple of years, the amount of spending has grown faster than the amount of stuff for sale. And so we have inflation, and that's that's a problem uh, when money loses its value. And the goal is to bring this back into alignment. We're, and I, I do. I'm going to talk about you define also 
a depression. Yes, I, I find it very interesting. A lot of people think of economics like physics or biology. In fact, the, the when we call call it the economic science, we we perpetuate that. It's not like physics, and it's not like biology. It's it's a social science. It's an it's an attempt to understand how people interact as it relates to to money and goods. So, it's it's something that involves a lot a, a good deal of judgment and uh, and subjective calls as to how we allocate society society's resources. More information, understandableeconomics.us, understandableeconomics.us. Of course, we've got the links up at louisfreeshow.com, wfmj.com, et cetera. My guest is the author of Understandable Economics, attorney, professor, how ears. I do you where do you think things are going with inflation, if you don't mind? I, well, obviously it's really interesting and it's on a lot of people's minds. So yes. as I explained a moment ago, inflation is the the amount of spending or money out there is increasing faster than the amount of stuff bidding up the prices of most things and you could solve that problem in one of two ways if you think about it you can decrease the amount of spending which is what the fed is trying to do by raising interest rates loans are loans are more expensive interest rate the interest rate is the cost of a loan so people borrow less people spend less and it brings down the amount of spending or you could deal with the other side of the equation, increase the amount of stuff. People don't often think about that. And the reason is the Fed has no ability to increase the amount of stuff. They have no ability to increase the manufacture of cars or electronic equipment or food or shelter. They have no control over that. So they do what they can. They control the one thing that they, they um, have power over and that's the amount of money and spending. But the best way to cure inflation is to just have more stuff produced, have a more productive economy. And that's something that people often, often lose sight of. And the economy has really taken a hit between COVID and the war in Ukraine and climate issues have reduced output of, of some crops. So the amount of stuff we have available to us has, has taken a hit. It's not as much as it could be. And I think that's incumbent on the government to try to address those problems. Uh, attorney, professor, I love that. Howard Garris, let me ask you about, when we think about all the jobs that are out there, there are so many everywhere. Everywhere I go, I see you know, help wanted, et cetera, et cetera. I know some businesses, some uh, restaurants in this area are not open seven days a week now because they, they can't get staff. Uh, they'll be open Monday through Saturday or Wednesday through Sunday or whatever. And it's troubling to me. Oh, and by the way, there's another store that had a big sign that said, now hiring 15-year-olds. 15-year-olds. I, I can send you, I'll send, I took a picture of it. I was just stunned. I kept looking at him thinking, I'm reading this wrong. Somehow I'm, it's not, <laughs> I'm not getting it. And it's like 15-year-olds, they're desperate. Are there not enough people? Are there not enough people seeking jobs? What's going on? Well, two points. One, that's what the Fed is trying to address. It's trying to slow our economy. What happens? The Fed is raising interest rates. I think most people have read that headline. Yes. What does that do? It causes people to borrow less and spend less. So that filters through to the, to the whole economy. Fewer people go out to restaurants the need for labor goes down. People will, will lose jobs or people will not be hired because interest rates, interest rates are higher. But America is really fortunate in one way. It there are people who want to immigrate here. We shoot ourselves in the foot by not having people come here and work and be productive. That's when you people talk about it, American exceptionalism, that's where it comes from. It's from the immigrants. Immigrants are primarily responsible for building this nation. And you know, there's, there's a lot of bad stuff in American history, but right now we desperately need workers. There are a lot of jobs that need to be filled. And if we could get our immigration act together, I think it could be a win-win for America as well as for the people who have the good fortune to come here. 
the national debt. And I appreciate that because I've what I a friend, I have a dear friend that we talk regularly, and he was saying there's just there's not enough people. That's and what, fortunately, that's America's in a position to to solve that problem completely. Yeah. There are as no shortage of people, fortunately, who are, would love to come here. Well, I hope you don't mind if I ask this, but why do you think we can't get it together on an immigration policy? I mean, it just seems I, 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 there's one side. What I don't like about the politics and and I hate to say the two party, two dominant party system is one blames the other one, the other, and nothing gets done. It's you know, very unfortunate. Was, My main air expertise is in economics. It's not in politics. I the parties have been unable to agree on a coherent immigration policy for decades. And I don't see any change in that in the near future. And it's really unfortunate because America loses out and the potential immigrants lose out. So it's a lose-lose situation. It's very, very sad that they can't get their act together on that issue. Yeah, I and I agree. I, I didn't want to get... I'm not getting political with it. I'm saying both. It's just, uh, why can't? Because as you were saying, if we had, if if we could bring the immigrants in and get them working and take these jobs, we've got to get a, figure out a way. I just, I'm frustrated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think a lot of people are frustrated. And I think whatever compromise they would make would probably be better than the totally incoherent policy we have right now. I, I certainly agree. We the national debt. You explain it. I mean, I, again, I love the book Understandable Economics. Tell me about. Tell us about the national debt. It's huge. There's no denying that. I read in the newspaper recently that it hit thirty-one trillion dollars. That's a massive, scary number, and it's used by a lot of people to scare voters into supporting less government spending. What does it mean? What is the $31 trillion? I, I use an anecdote in Understandable Economics uh, where a congressperson mentioned something cost a billion dollars and someone asked, well, wasn't it a million? And they couldn't remember whether it's a billion or a million. And the point I make is that's the same difference as my saying, I can't remember whether my sandwich for lunch cost $10 or $10,000. It's the same order of magnitude. The point is these numbers, to me, they have no meaning. Maybe to you they do, but they don't have meaning to me. And I would venture to guess- they, they, Believe people. me, they have no meaning to me. So I break it down on a per American basis. And what is it? It's about $1,000 a year in interest payments, and it's close to $70,000 of debt per person. Anyone with a mortgage, anyone who went to medical school, anyone- Almost anyone who went to medical school, almost anyone who started a business has debt that far exceeds that. Is that too much or too little? Again, there's no formula in the world that you're going to plug in numbers and get an answer. It's a subjective judgment whether you think that's too much or it's okay. And every American should think about that number. The point is, if we spend money wisely, like I use an example of some preschool education that has a return on the investment of 13%, that's a clear winner. If we just use the money to push expenses down the road, no, that's just wasteful. The question is how the money's spent. And the if you use $70,000 to go to, to medical school or borrow $70,000 to start a business that looks, that looks like it's going to do well, most people would say that's a good reason. If you borrow $70,000 to support an illegal drug, drug habit, most people would say that that's, that's a very bad decision. <laughs> It depends what the debt is for. So the two things, you need to look at the, the amount of debt, $70,000, which is a number most people can get their heads around, 31 trillion out of the question. I don't think most people can get their heads around that. And then what that $70,000 is supporting. Is it supporting good programs that's going to make us a more productive economy? I think it. I think a lot of people would conclude it makes sense. If it's, it's just pushing expenses down the road so that our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren will pay for them. No, that probably doesn't make sense. No. So you have to look at you just can't react to 31 trillion. Sounds big, has to be bad. It's much more, it's you know, I, I the the subtitle of the book says it's simpler than you think. It it is simpler than you think, but it's not very simple objectively. You have to think about those two things and put it in perspective. And you you can develop an opinion if you if you um think about it. 
I have to say that it was interesting because that's the that part in the book you just mentioned about the congressman and the sandwich. And I, I that's where I was at. That's where I just was going to ask you right. about that and say that because that's that kind of brings it, makes you understand, makes you think about, it, you know, and congressman. I mean, that's just, that's uh, outrageous. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Professor Attorney Howard Eris about his book, Understandable Economics, because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know. Government, you talk about government spending. And one of the things, again, you're the economist, you're the educated one. I am not, but I've always thought, you know, if I write a check and the money, there's insufficient funds or whatever, I, I, I intentionally write a check, let me say, intentionally write a check that I know that the money isn't there. That's a crime. Government, and again, I understand individual government, government has to function differently. It does function differently. It just seems, talk, well, let me ask you, I'm sorry, talk with us about government spending that you address in the book. I'm, I'm ranting. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very excited about your book. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I'm not excited. sorry that I'm excited. I'm sorry that I'm ranting too much. Well, the federal government, when it spends money, does have to balance its checkbook. It has to raise every dollar of government spending is raised in one of two ways. It either raises it through taxes or it borrows it. So those are the two ways the government gets money. It either raises it either raises taxes or um, borrows money. And it's been borrowing a lot of money lately. It has to borrow the difference between what it spends and what it collects in taxes. Now, the Federal Reserve can buy those bonds, and this gets into some detail and understandable economics, and, and create new money. But the ability, this is a very, very important point for people to realize, Biden and the Congress cannot simply walk over to the basement of the Treasury, stick their hands out and grab the cash as it's coming out off the printing press. That, was a, that has consistently proven to be a disaster. Weimar Republic is the classic example where, where the government started printing so much money. It's called hyperinflation. They basically printed money to pay for programs. Why did they do that? Because they didn't want to raise taxes and they might have and they probably had trouble borrowing because they were irresponsible. So they just printed money to pay for whatever they needed. And what happens when they did that? Prices went up. So they just printed more money and they kept printing more and more money and the economy goes into a death spiral. People had to use wheelbarrows of currency to buy a loaf of bread. There's a great anecdote in the book where you go to a restaurant, sit down, order food. And by the time the bill comes, the prices have gone up. up. Yeah, <laughs> great. So yeah, the Fed controls, strictly controls the amount of money that goes into the economy. If, if our political system, if our government wants to spend more, they either have to raise taxes or borrow it. They don't get to just stick their hands out under the feds print under under the printing press and grab the cash as it's coming off. So when people say more government spending, this is where I'm going with this, more government spending is inflationary. The answer is it depends. If they spend money to make the economy more productive, it's not. Again, what is inflation? Too much spending compared to the amount of stuff. If they spend money to increase the amount of stuff available to make people more productive, to get people into jobs and allow them to produce things. No, actually, it reduces prices because there's more stuff to buy. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's it's not that simple. If they print money and waste it, absolutely. I was reading over the weekend about this high-speed train, which in theory sounds like a good idea in, in California between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And the price is now over $100 billion here in New York. We built the Second Avenue subway after about 70 years, and it was $2.2 billion per mile. These seem like good public projects, but you also have to factor in the price. They had a similar subway extension in Paris that cost approximately $400 million a mile, a small fraction of what it cost in New York. Why is there such a difference? Again, government spending, people rant and rave against government spending. If it's done right, it's it's it. It fulfills an essential need, and if it doesn't, it's it's a waste. It's you, one size doesn't fit all. Some is good, some is bad, and it's it's just not that simple. That government spending or regulation, for that matter, some is good and essential, and some is wasteful. 
and you have to look at each and assess it carefully. Ladies and gentlemen, understandableeconomics.us, understandableeconomics.us, book available and everywhere online. Please try to buy it as close to home as possible. It's Prometheus book, so it's available everywhere. And by the way, it was very disturbing when you said at the beginning of our conversation about, I used the term pitching the book and they, they wanted to see, it wasn't about the content. It wasn't about the importance of the book. It was more about, do you have a platform? And I that's disturbing to me because then I start to worry about what gets printed, what or more importantly, what doesn't get printed. Again, it's the winner take all. And this came up, Penguin Random House is proposing to merge with Simon & Schuster, yes, two one. of the largest publishers. And I think a merger like that is only going to further that winner take all economy and it's going to make it more difficult for for people without significant platforms to get published yeah and that that's a concern of mine it's like again all that consolidation and it's kind of like the news and the and lack of newspaper independent independent mm -hmm. or smaller publishers do you feel we're moving towards a cashless society to some extent yes the especially the the new tap uh, uh, the ability to use your credit card by tapping it on something. I think we are. And I think, I think it makes, it's just facilitates transactions. It's, it's easier to, to use uh, credit cards or pay with your phone than it is to carry around what, what is a pocket full of change an ever increasing amount of change because it seems to accumulate, but never, never uh, go down. So yes, I think we are becoming more cashless. It's not a question of my thinking, it's a fact. So yes, and there are other countries, there are countries in Europe that are, are much further along that path than we are where cash is almost never used. When, when, you, when you said that about paying with, you know, I didn't know that about tapping a card on, on the machine. I saw, uh, and this was, I don't know how many months ago, a young man, when I was getting gas, a young man put his, or his uh, watch on top of the machine. And I asked him what he said. I said, did you just pay with, he, oh, he said, yeah, you know, it's just, I, it just astounds me. Some of the technology astounds me and concerns me, I dare say. Well, the New York City subway, which is not known for being terribly innovative, you could now just hold your phone up against the turnstile and go in that way. Uh, <laughs> I, you blow my mind. You really do on so many levels with so many things in your book understandable economics because understanding our economy is easier than you think and more important than you know. Again, I love the book and I'm saying, I know I'm repeating myself, yet I think it's important. Someone like my, you, you make it understandable for all of us. Obviously you're a very, very bright, very, very well edged. You are. Oh, now you know, <laughs> don't self-deprecate. I'm the one, I'm the self-deprecator. <laughs> it's, it's accurate when I say that. And you've been able to take really difficult concepts for most of us and made it understandable. And I, I want to say this, and I hope this doesn't sound like a backhanded compliment, enjoyable to read. I, I, that's another thing. I didn't think it would be, forgive me, again, there's no filter between my brain and my mouth, which sometimes is an asset and sometimes a liability. I didn't anticipate that. I didn't expect that. I, I didn't think I wouldn't like it, but I didn't think it would be enjoyable that it would flow. And it does. I really appreciate your saying that. And that was a very Thank big you. goal of mine. But it's I've taught enough students over the years who are bored and un, just yeah. dissociated from the school and just cynical. And my goal was to figure out how to grab their attention. So with all due modesty, I got pretty good at figuring out ways to make it entertaining and um, accessible. And you have, and you have. Again, I, I I, don't know how many times I've said it. I love the book and I, I get it. And I feel so much more comfortable and knowledgeable of talking about things and thinking about economics than I did before. And I'm grateful to you. Again, understandableeconomics.us. Do you take a minute and tell us about the website? Sure. The website has a summary of the book. It has a lot of comments from 
people who are somewhat prominent and people who are not prominent at all, prominent at all talking about the book. There's information about me. And there's also uh, a way to contact me. I can give you my email address. It's Howard Yaris, all one word, at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear from readers with any thoughts, comments, criticisms they have on the book. And I'd even be happy to participate in a book club if they if they were interested That's in wonderful. reading the book. That's so wonderful. I'd love to hear from people regarding the book. I really appreciate feedback. Well, I again, you did a tremendous job and I've really enjoyed, and your personality. I like your personality also. <laughs> <laughs> we have a mutual admiration society here. I think you, you do a great job too. And I really appreciate you having me on your show. I'm grateful for you and doing the work that you do. And I had a blast with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a great guy. And ladies and gentlemen, I will, do want to tell you again, the book, you will, you'll get it. You will, you'll understand it. Again, it blew my mind because 